this is what I'm going to talk to you uh, in a nutshell. Actually, you can take one look and, and go. Now, I know you're going to be a hard audience. I already saw some people dozing off during the introduction. I knew what I was coming up against, so I really tried to make it as lively as possible, but uh, please don't hate me. Um, yes, I used to need my pointer. Now, uh, the, uh, so uh, I, I sort of tried to, uh, to put as many pictures as possible, you know, uh, and, and, and also to, to make it like, a, like something like, a, like an after-dinner movie. There'll be, um, there'll be a crisis at one point, I think. There'll be pictures. There might be a little quiz, if you want, at one point. And, uh, uh, but there will probably be a happy ending. Another, I'm also very happy that uh, uh, this is an invited talk, because I don't think I would have made the criteria for them. <laughs> you might have noticed that the word literature did not appear on the in, in Jan's statistics, so I'm going to, I'm going to be unashamedly uh, uh, literary. Okay, let's, let's start. Um, I'm going to start with a quotation from a, from a friend of mine, Matt Jokers, uh, who wrote this, uh, some people say, provocative book last year, uh, Macroanalysis, Dig Digital Methods and Literary History, where he had the temerity to say that the literary scholar of the 20 21st century can no longer be content with anecdotal evidence he calls everything literary study has achieved so far as anecdotal. Why does he call it anecdotal? He says, well, we say we take five Victorian authors, five books each, and we say, this is the model for Victorian literature. While we know that about 20,000 different novels were published during the Victorian era alone. So those 50 books, they're supposed to be the, the satisfying model. Perhaps they are, but we don't know and we won't know until we check. So, uh, so, so some people call us new literary studies, but the, the key mark here is, I think, the question mark. Um, uh, because I'm not really sure this is really anything new. It's just slightly different, using slightly different methods, but the questions are still very literary and this is what we want. Uh, normally at this point when I'm preaching to, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here basically, but when I'm preaching to our good friends, the traditional literary scholars, this is the bit that is supposed to make them, you know, a bit happier. That they have to sit through this. Okay, another quotation that comes from my guru David Hoover of New York University. Uh, the, when I say we, I'll be mostly uh, referring to we the stylometrists or the stylometricians or the computational stylists, I think. And, uh, and, and what we're basically interested in, we, we try to support traditional literary study with quantitative methods. Uh, we are not really, sorry for saying that, we are not really that much interested in what this tells about the language, we are really interested what the numbers in the language tell us about literature. So this is, this is, where, this is where we're going. And uh, now, obviously, uh, stylometry, which is in the center here, uh, it is usually born out of authorship attribution, that authorship attribution where you don't have the handwriting or, or eyewitness testimony, but when you have to count words or commas or something to figure out that uh, you know, J.K. Rowling actually did read, did write the book about the cuckoo's calling or something like that. Uh, now, uh, uh, but of course on the other poll we have Franco Moretti's distant reading, which is exactly what Matt Jokers was referring to. Reading a lot of books, thousands, millions of, bo millions and millions of books that we can, will never read in the traditional way. We can use the stupid machines, the computers, to help us grasp uh, the, the bigger picture, the, the macro uh, picture, as Jokers says. Uh, so, uh, again, Hoover uh, uh, is slowly bringing us to the stuff I do, and, and this is the, the multivariate statistical analysis of large amounts of data, large amounts of data, can mean anything. You'll see in a moment what I mean by that. 
Um, but uh, and 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 because we are trying very hard to be listened to by the traditional literary scholars, we try not to speak in numbers, but at least with with pictures. And by the way, you receive the same treatment tonight. So, so the things that we don't do are such beautiful uh, maps of the British Isles where the different names of the authors have been placed, you know, by geotagging. Oh, that would be cool, too. Uh, nor do we want to draw a map based on external evidence on who uh, uh, influenced who uh, Shakespeare is supposed to have influenced Emily Bronte, who in turn is supposed to have influenced Sylvia Plath. Uh, it, fine. Now we're not looking for for this for this kind of literary maps or literary networks. We're looking into the text, and we're trying to use objective textual uh, 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 evidence to uh, draw our own maps. So, so that particular mafia to which I belong. Uh, we do this. Well, we, we like to uh, take very frequent words or lemmas or tags or some other fairly easily identifiable elements of, of our literary text. And, and then for each text in the corpus, uh, 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 we, uh, we normalize the frequencies of those most frequent words. That is, of course, the to minimize text size impact, which can be considerable. And then we and then we uh, arrive at those maps, at those measures of similarity or dissimilarity between texts uh, by applying some measures. Uh, some have already been invented by statisticians. Some have been uh, sort of tailor-made for uh, for stylometry. John Burroughs's delta is is our favorite one. Uh, it's it's sort of still going strong. And and then we we use some sort of. Uh, data reduction procedure, like cluster analysis, multidimensional scaling, uh, 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 um, the principal component analysis, to, to detect the nearest neighbors. And, and then we try to make assumptions on, on the text based on their proximity and uh, distance on, on the maps. And this is basically it. So, uh, oh yes, and, uh, there it is. Uh, so, uh, so what we're so what I'm going to show to you here is is to uh, show you how this is done by using a stylo package for the R uh, statistical programming uh, environment uh, that Machi Eder, Mike Kestemon, and, and and myself have have done. Uh, it has acquired some uh, popularity among stylometrists uh, because it combines the speed of of R, which is and which is also an open source thing, so that's a uh, thing go for that. And uh, uh, with, uh, with some pretty good text processing features, uh, so uh, also uh, part of that was quite by accident. Anyway, the, uh, now uh, the, the, the only one, the, 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 the only person here uh, who received any uh, formal programming instruction who has a degree in programming is Mike Kestemont of the University of Antwerp, uh, Maciej Eder, who wrote most of the code, and myself, we are plain, honest, old-fashioned literary scholars. So I'm completely out of place here. Uh, so uh, so let, me, let me show you what it does. So, so the first thing we do, um, we basically count stuff, and, and for reasons that will I'll explain later. The, the best thing to count from our point of view is still just the most frequent words. So what we do is we take a bunch of books and this, of course, this is the quiz part if you guys want to, or do I, shouldn't I bother? So this is of course from Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen, okay, and this is um, uh, 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 Tristan Shandy, and this is Hard Times, and this is Wuthering Heights, and this I never know. It's either Pamela or Clarissa, one of those horrible, uh, horribly long 18th century English novels. Anyway, now we don't take the most famous uh, 
uh, first sentence of all those, which we take the whole text, obviously. And the first thing we do, we destroy all syntactical uh, uh, um, uh, information by treating them as, uh, by applying the bug of uh, uh, words uh, approach. Which gives us, in the end, something like that. We have a, a frequency-based list of those words, and, and obviously the is usually the most frequent word in, in English, and then there's two, and and, and off, and I, and they're <coughs> usually up there. And then we come to the, to the absolutely brilliant conclusion that, that, for instance, for Jane Austen to write Emma, all she needed to do was to write the 536 times, and, and then, you, then you have 540 of twos, which actually reminds me of, of what uh, James Joyce said when someone asked him, so how's Ulysses going? He said, he is going fine, I have all the words and I have to put them in the right order. Uh, and so now this is not very informative, unless you're, you like to memorize long columns of, of words. Obviously, the, the, our interest doesn't end here. It goes well into the basement, uh, into the hundreds and the thousands, thousands of those most frequent words. But still, as you can see, they are not very meaningful words. I don't see love. I don't see brother. I don't see country. I don't see orgasm. It's just the linguistic mud that, that is there. And this is the frightening thing. This is what works. Anyway, so we need to, to, to normalize it somehow, so we use Barros's delta, uh, uh, which is, uh, is a pretty simple measure. Uh, it already is 12 years old. Uh, this is the formula, if you're interested. Uh, so, so we simply calculate a lot of those deltas between uh, pairs uh, of texts within a given corpus. Oh, by the way, sorry. When I say corpus, we, the stupid literary people, we just mean a bunch of texts, nothing more. So, sorry. Uh, anyway, so now in the end we get something slightly more telling, because here we have the, the delta distance, which already shows us the, the distances, or the dissimilarity, if you want, between the particular texts. And see what happens. Let's look, let's look at the distances to Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's book. Now, for Tenant of Wildfell Hall, by one of the Brontes sisters, this is above one. Then we have 0.78 for Emma. Aha, Jane Austen again. And then we have 0.69 for Sense and Sensibility. Aha, Jane Austen again. And then we move again into the above one. Uh, which shows you that if this is the same author, then uh, the, the deltas are really, are really small. That works. We don't really know why. We would, I, I always hope that someone will rise in the audience on one of those talks and say, you fool, this is because... So I'm, I'm waiting. Anyway, so uh, now, but of course, this is not something we want to show to our good friends, the traditional literary scholars, obviously. <laughs> Uh, because they would cross themselves and run away. Uh, so we do pictures. By the way, all this uh, is done using our package uh, for R. Uh, it just it reads in all the text, it, it does all the counting, and then it produces the, the, the pretty pictures. So here is a cluster analysis of, uh, of a table like the one I've just shown you. Uh, which, uh, which tries to attribute the authorship of, uh, of 27 books. And you can see by the smart color coding that it works every time. Uh, Richardson's Pamela is always with Richardson's Pamela. Uh, a Trollope is Trollope, third is third, etc., etc. So as far as authorship attribution is concerned, this seems to be working uh, perfectly. Okay, this was done for just, these were delta calculated for just 100 most frequent words. Let's see what happens when we use 200 most frequent words. Aha! Uh -huh. As far as authorship attribution success is concerned, everything is working perfectly uh, uh, once again. 300, there you go. Very nice. 400, aha. Uh -huh. 500. Okay, I was probably showing that too quickly, but most of you, those of you who are not asleep already, have, must have noticed that it's not always the same diagram. That while the 
texts of the same authors are always attributed correctly. By the way, this is a very nicely behaved corpus. Um, uh, the, the other connections are not always uh, the same. Uh, uh, except for one, you might have noticed that the three Bronte sisters are always there together. Um, well, it does make sense they did live in the same room for most of their lives and they worked together. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if this also recognizes DNA. Or, uh, but um, the, the question is, okay, so if we are able to beautifully attribute all those texts, does uh, the, 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 what does the next uh, level show? Does this mean that George Eliot and Dickens are also very similar? Well, it does seem to be the case in terms of, uh, of the Bronte sisters, but that is biographically and historically obvious, I think. Although, when you come back and think about, wait a minute, but it's still about the usage of the most frequent words that most authors don't really think about. Um, so uh, uh, that might be another problem. So, so whom to believe? Uh, the 500 most frequent words, the 400 most frequent words, uh, uh, 300 most frequent words. Now, uh, the one thing you want to do, you, you might do, is compromise and simply make all those five or more diagrams vote in what we call the bootstrap consensus tree. And, and the linkages there are simply the ones that are the most frequent in uh, ba uh, uh, based on uh, basing on a, a number of of values for 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 a given uh, for given parameters, but uh, this looks nice and clean. By the way, this seems to su suggest that there is a lot in common between George Eliot and, and Dickens, and still uh, the three Bronte sisters are very much are very similar, uh, uh, and and this is also makes. Historical sense because this is the 18th century male writers uh, of England. Uh, so I, I, I like this. But there's one problem. What if we don't have 27 books? What happens when we have 100, 200, 300? I mean, the visualization becomes uh, non visible. I think that's bad English. So, uh, so what we need to do is we have to go into network analysis if you want to look at what happens when you uh, uh, look in the same way at something like 600 English novels. So what I have for you here is a, is a pretty little globe. Uh, it's not my fault. This is how it happened. I mean, this is what the Gephi networking software did out of those networks. You might want to imagine uh, those links between the particular uh, uh, texts as uh, as rubber bands of of different uh, uh, width of different size. Whenever they are thick, like say uh, this one here, the pink one, the oops, the purple, sorry, the purple one uh, here, then they usually tend to. Uh, stick together. Whenever they are thin, they allow themselves to be drawn apart. This is what one of the algorithms that we use does. So what I see, what we get here is a map of uh, English literature, if you want. Some Americans have been added too. Uh, and uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, there is a distinct, at least a chronological signal that is evident here, apart from the very strong authorial signal, because obviously you can see that those patches of colors uh, brought together, they are uh, they denote uh, text by the same authors. But look what happens when we go to the north, we get a bunch of 18th century writing. Jane Austen, Fanny Burney, lots of uh, third-rate sentimentalist literature, uh, uh, Goldsmith, uh, uh, Maria Edgeworth, uh, very, very, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Then as we move a little further to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the West, we get uh, more 18th century stuff, uh, some uh, Gothic novels, then there's, then there's the uh, pretty archaic historical uh, romances by uh, Balwer Lytton of uh, the uh, 19th century, and one little surprise, this is where Tolkien's Silmar Silmar Tolkien Silmar Silmarillion comes. Uh, uh, which I think we should write a paper about, probably. 
uh, and then here, okay, all that purple, that's Dickens. Uh, we'll return to Dickens in a moment. The other Victorians are happily gathered around him. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and this is quite interesting. Uh, uh, here's Joyce, the, the light blue line. This is Joyce. Look how nicely he evolves from the portrait of the art. Actually, no, this, is, this is the dark. Uh, this is the dark blue. Here, here it is. He evolves from the Dubliners and portrait of the artists, which are pretty uh, straightforward 19th century style literature, to Ulysses, which is more experimental, to Finnegan's Wake, which is even more. And if you write Finnegan's Wake, that only brings you close to that crazy Slav uh, Vladimir Nabokov. Uh, I really like that uh, effect. Okay, any other thing? Okay, this is what I call my bad writing corner. Uh, we have Rowling here, and, and Dan Brown, and Ludlum, and Clancy, and Coburn, and I never liked D.H. Lawrence, so uh, there it is. Um, uh, so uh, I'm a bit worried about Lord of the Flies, though, here, but that's far away. Anyway, so uh, you can see that there are things to which literary scholars can relate. This diagram makes a lot of sense in, in terms of traditional literary uh, history. Uh, which is a bit frightening when we remember that it's all based on the most frequent words. Okay, uh, now this is not just the chronological signal, because the chronological signal can be whimsical. When we took a look at Dickens, for instance, and we mark his early stuff in green, his later stuff in yellow, etc., you can see that he that in, there is a distinct evolution that in fact the stylometric measure of his of the uh, usage of the most frequent words corresponds very nicely to the classical division of uh, Dickens into experimental first mature and late periods uh, this makes literary scholars really excited what makes literary scholars less excited is uh, the same uh, the thing done to Sienkiewicz, the Polish Nobel Prize winner of 1905, who's, uh, who does not work chronologically. However, the clear division lies here. These are the uh, contemporary Roman de Meur, and these are adventure novels and romantic uh, and, and, and historical romances. So uh, um, it looks like uh, um, uh, Sienkiewicz. Uh, uh, sort of shows in this way shows more of a of a, a genre signal than uh, than than, the, than a chronological one. And in fact, we uh, we do observe the mixture of both the chronological and the genre signal, among other things, which of course screws up our authorship attribution. But then it, we hope, speaks volumes about literature in general. Okay, uh, okay. Now this is what happens when you throw 1,000 Polish novels, and uh, I'm not going to torture you with the titles. Uh, what I want to show is that the, the color coding uh, has been done by half centuries. This is uh, the 18th and the first half of the, uh, of the 19th century, and then as the red gets darker, the, it moves in uh, tower, our, towards our times. The, the red-brown here at the, at the at this orbit, this is the 21st century novels. And, and there is a clear uh, transition from early uh, to late. And, it's, and again, remembering what we saw in Sienkiewicz and in Dickens, this is not just the changes in language. Also, we're speaking of the most frequent words, only the ones that are there. So uh, some old-fashioned uh, uh, forms, uh, of course, do not come into the, the calculation. OK, uh, let's do one thing better. That's a horrible mess. Uh, but no wonder. Uh, anything that's white is Polish literature. Anything that's red is, uh, um, is uh, Polish translations of English novels. Anything that's blue is Polish translations of French novels. We're speaking of 2,000 uh, novels here. And, and the thing that you can see is that it looks like Translating from the English uh, makes you write a slightly different Polish uh, than when you're writing a book in the original Polish. I know, I've massacred almost 30 novels into Polish, so I know what happens. Uh, but, but actually, that's, that's interesting. And in fact, I think we can go 3D. 
This is the same thing, uh, isn't that cool? Uh, uh, and, and white is, is Polish again. And you can see that the, that the red Polish translation of English novels are sort of apart, plus the, the, the white uh, uh, that is untouched by the other colors, this seems to be uh, uh, the earliest Polish literature. So uh, I'm thinking influence of the translations on, on the literature. So uh, obviously uh, uh, this, it seems that uh, uh, there is something to get out of this horrible mess. But that is the problem. It's a mess. We can't really pretend to see, uh, you know, um, individual books here. Uh, we, this is just a macro vision, and this is one of the problems. Okay, back to the uh, presentation. Okay, yes, and it gets even worse when you throw in 9,000 English novels. I, look at that, it's, it's just an ugly blotch. Uh, this is uh, 18th... Uh, century the blue purple is 19th century and all that is white is 20th and 21st century i don't really know how to uh, 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 how to interpret this this view of the history of english literature uh, well obviously uh, it only shows and one thing that it does show is the uh, is the general availability of 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 the of of works sorry uh, but, uh, but apart from that, it's, it's very messy. We need new tools. I'll be talking about that in a moment. Uh, now, okay. Most frequent words are fine, but nobody's really happy with most frequent words. The problem with most frequent words is that they still work best as far as authorship attribution is concerned. We've been running text, the tests one way and the other, and nothing beats most frequent words. Uh, but uh, interesting things can be found when we tag uh, our texts uh, doing this. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so we converted a, couple, uh, a bunch of novels by uh, English modernists into, into this form, into, into part of speech tags. And, uh, and what we got was, was this. And that's pretty neat because now, the, the sequences of, uh, of uh, tags, rather than words, they are one cheap, uh, rough way of somehow showing the, the syntax, perhaps, the, the, the construction of the sentence. It's a very, it's a very, as I said, it's a very cheap uh, 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 method, but uh, let's see what it does. Well, it certainly shows something we wanted to see, Nabokov, whose literary style in English is, well, almost plain Russian, uh, is out here. You can see that there is not even uh, the thinnest line connecting him to anyone. And there's another outsider, oh my god, another Slav, Joseph Conrad. And to make things even funnier, his earlier, earliest stuff is the furthest out from this bunch. And only as he continues writing his work approximates that of some of the people who helped him, Wells, Galsworthy, etc. So uh, there is perhaps hope in, in, in part of speech tagging, uh, especially when treated in this quasi-syntactic way. Okay, uh, now, what about words that mean something for once? Uh, uh, John Burroughs, again, found a nice way of finding the medium frequency content <laughs> words by dividing texts that you study into equal size samples and not looking for words that appear very frequently in one or two of the samples, but for looking words that, for words that appear at all, but consistently throughout all the samples in a given text. Uh, and, uh, and here you can compare author to author, book to book, but also groups of authors to groups of authors. So in one experiment, one of the riskiest in my life ever, I, uh, I uh, compared the favorite words of male authors and female authors uh, in 19th century English fiction 
And look what I found to be uh, the words that are consistently used by women and consistently not used by men. Agitated, wishes, feeling, anxiety, amiable, happiness, conscious, deeply, oh, absence, sensations, lovely, delicacy. It's not me, it's statistics. <laughs> and the men, well, perhaps less uh, obvious, but a lot of archization. There must be blood. There's king and prince, even though there were no historical romances in that, uh, in that selection. It's just the, met the metaphors that account for the frequency of king and adventure, and by the way, author. And now, so now let's take those words if we dare, and try to draw a map of English literature starting from the 18th to the 20th century and see what happens. So what you get is a dolphin. Uh, actually, I've got my colors screwed up here and uh, blue are women and red are men. I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, now, first of all, we have a strong chronological signal. This is early, this is late. And, and this is 18th century and they're basically all, all women. Then, as we advance into history, it seems that we have a, a separate evolution of feminine and masculine writing until it gets much more mixed up in the later Victorian era. And we still have some enclaves of feminine writing, and you won't be very surprised to see that these are the Anne of Green Gable novels by Lucy Montgomery, uh, and I think, and some of the wolves are here as well. But in general, the uh, the mixture is is quite complete, as you can see. Uh, and uh, actually, this is this is the kind of picture that made my uh, feminist scholar friends really, really happy. Uh, by the way, the the blue enclave here among later literature. You'd have probably never guessed this is J.K. Rowling. Uh, mm, uh, so, okay, so the dolphin. Uh, right. Uh, now comes the crisis. This is very nice and colorful. And I don't see anyone who has fallen off his or her chair asleep. So I'm, I feel I'm pretty successful here. But we have a problem. Uh, what we have at this point is more data than we know what to do with. Uh, I can show you 600 author uh, works and make some sense out of it. But then I add a zero at the end and I can't even visualize it in a sensible way. Uh, there it is. We also have and this is quite interesting, more stuff that our poor little computers can process anymore. You see, stylometry uh, developed on those single pieces that the humanists got and didn't know what to do with, so they invented, and they invented, and they invented modern stylometry. Right now, uh, those computers are not enough. Uh, and right now, we cannot really work alone or in threes like Maciej and Mike uh, and myself do. So what we need, and uh, you can see I'm sort of uh, 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 pushing my agenda here on you. Uh, 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 we need more computing power, obviously. We need very different ways of visualization uh, uh, so that we can visualize those huge amount of data. So, um, I, I, okay, I, I'm almost afraid to use the term big data because obviously this is not big data in the in the physics kind of sense. But but from a literary point of view, you know, thousands of books that's big to me, uh, especially if you count the words. Uh, then we need professionals to do our programming for us. Now the our R style of package, I mean the the first version version O version O point O one A was made on the train ride from the Leipzig Summer School in Digital Humanities to Krakow. That's a long ride. Uh, but but there, there was just one of us plus me helping a little with the graphic user interface so I could use it on my students. Uh, the time of this pioneer work is gone. 
a plus we really need to all this power and all those professionals to break the hegemony of the most frequent word approach which we love because it's giving us our beautiful results and pretty pictures but there is more to language than the bag of words approach okay i promised you a happy ending here it comes enter claren pl uh, uh, and maciej piasecki is sitting here right in the middle of the room we didn't plan that uh, so so this is what we're, what we're doing now this is you can see this big, this thick purple line here that uh, everything above, this is our simple style of thing. We, we put in some documents with simple <coughs> metadata and our metadata is laughable usually. Name of author, title, date, perhaps the translator if we're dealing with translation, that's all. Uh, this is processed by our silo and we visualize it either in R or in, or in Gephi or whatnot. And we're done. Now, in Wrocław, they have a lot of goodies. They have a lot of stuff. Also, they have a lot of stuff that works with that, with that horrible, horrible Polish language, which uh, is terribly difficult to, to grasp uh, using artificial intelligence. Now, they have all this. So what we're going to do, and we're in the early stages of, uh, of doing that, is we will start building bridges between in some places and here and here and here and hoping to build a system one day which will be working as a whole uh, using all the power of of natural language and processing as, it, as is represented by you guys and the and the humanistic literary blah blah that we seem to be moving around and and this is the happy ending